Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 14th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, both an Anchorage Daily News editorial board op-ed and another in the Anchorage Press mislead to tilt against the PFD. Second, the ADN's Just the Facts piece on Prop 1 misses on a central fact. And third, surprisingly, Charles Wolforth tells us that Prop 2, the Open Primaries Initiative, is really also about the PFD. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's start off with the editorial board question, because I think that's where I think that's what we need to. Uh, I think that's what we need to talk about first. Is that it's the uh, the editorial board question uh, that came forward. They put out a piece that uh, basically makes the argument that you know we're basically trading the PFD for whatever. And I think that is uh, you know that's been kind of uh, something we've heard in the background for quite a while. And I think it's something that uh, quite honestly is um, uh, is just a false argument. But what say you? Well, it's I, I, there. There is a there is a theme uh, uh, through at least the first and third segment today, and also the Cesar Martinson uh, uh, article that you were referencing from the Anchorage Press uh, earlier. And that theme is that that people are beginning to say, well, we can't have a full PFD because in if in order to maintain gov- if we had a full PFD in order to maintain government then we're going to have to have all these taxes. And my God, we can't have these taxes. They would have a horrible impact on the economy and pull all this money out of the economy. And, 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 and it's sort of that theme that, that I think is, frankly, humorous, because the PFD pulls the same amount, whether you do it through PFD or other forms of taxes, you pull the same amount out of the private economy. If you're taking a billion and a half or a billion nine out of the economy through diverting the PFD to government, it's the same billion and a half or a billion nine that you're taking out of the economy through a sales tax or through an income tax. And and their focus is, the, the focus of these various pieces is on, oh my God, you can't do that. You can't take it out through an income tax or a sales tax. That's horrible. Look at the impact you're going to have on the economy. Look at the burden you're going to put on people. You can't do that. So you so you've got to do these PFD cuts instead. Well, they're the same thing. You're taking money. You're taking the same amount of money out of the economy one way or the other. And 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 the difference is on on who pays, and the difference is on the impact. Uh, on the economy. And ICER back in 2016 already told us the answer to both those questions. The answer to the, the answer to the question is of who pays is is middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20% get off with a trivial amount, non-residents pay nothing when you take it when you take it out through through PFD cuts. And they also told us the ICER 2016 study also told us what the impact was. Taking it out through PFD cuts has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy of all of the revenue measures that ICER looked at, which included income taxes and sales taxes and even a statewide property tax. Of all of those approaches, taking it out through a PFD cut 
uh, has the largest adverse impact on the economy. So what's really going on here is is I think we're we're we're, we're starting to get down toward the nub of the issue, which is the top 20 percent are are realizing that if we pay full F- PFDs, my gosh, they're going to have to pay right. a, a, a share of the cost of government. And my gosh, that's a huge burden for them to have to, to, have to pay a share of the costs of government. And they, and they don't want to do that. Right. And, and they don't want to cut and, – and, and they resist cutting government. So they're trying to push it off on – PFDs are trying to push it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. The, the thing they should be realizing is, yes, it's a heck of a burden, a huge burden uh, to, to, to fund government through, through, through taxes. And what we ought to be doing instead of trying to push it off on somebody else, instead of the top 20 percent saying we ought to push it off on middle and lower income Alaska families, we ought to be cutting government because it's a huge burden on the private sector to fund the, to fund the level of government we have. They're not making that connection. They're refusing to make that connection. They're resisting uh, making that connection. Both the ADN editorial column and and Cesar's column in uh, in the Anchorage Press. They're refusing to make that connection. Instead, they're saying, "Oh my gosh, we need to take it out of we need to take it out of the PFD instead," which is which is simply pushing the income tax, if you will, because PFD cuts are an income tax. They're 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 the diversion of private sector income set up by statute to the government, um, which is the classic definition of an income tax. And, 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 and what they're trying to do is push that income tax off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Well, we're getting close. Yeah. Frankly, I, frankly, this is a, this, this evolution in their argument is, is, is a good thing because we're getting close to them having to confront the fact that we have, too much government, we're, spe- we're, spending too, we're spending too much for government, and they're going to have to pay a share of it, and so they need to get behind pushing down the cost of government. We're getting close to that. This is sort of a, la- in my view, this is sort of a last, last gasp effort to say, oh my gosh, we can't have that tax burden. We've got right. to push it off on somebody else. Right. Um, the Hail but, Mary. But, but, right. The Hail Mary gotta, pass. But, but we've got to, we've got to, uh, 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 we've got to, We've got to put up with this argument, push back on this argument to get to them to focus on the cost of government. Yeah, I mean, this is really the the again, this is kind of the hail mary pass, and I think it ignores the uh, the the elephant in the room, which we've talked about in the past, which is how money works in an economy, especially when you put money in the hands of the pub of the uh, private sector, put money in the hands of citizens. That money flows and and uh, and is and turns over, right? Whereas, as we, yesterday we were talking with Donna Ardwin, uh, you know, money in the hands of government doesn't do the same thing. And so even if you did, even, you know, taking their arguments at face value and say we would have to have a we would have to have an income tax to offset and pay a full dividend, it would still be better to put that money in Alaska's hands through a dividend to begin with because the money would at least turn in the economy before they came back and took it out through uh, through income taxes. By just yep. bypassing the public completely, you've completely abrogated the effect of that money going into the economy directly. Well, yeah, you've taken it out of the hands of individuals who ICER found would would roll that money into the into the private sector economy, and it would it would bounce around the private sector economy, um, uh, and producing additional economic value. Uh, you've taken you've taken that money out of the hands of the private sector, and you've put it in the hands of of frankly. Uh, uh, what would it be? Twenty, uh, thirty, thirty-one legislators. Uh, the majority of the legislature, thir- thirty-one people, who who are going to decide where that money goes, instead of six hundred and fifty thousand uh, Alaskans uh, who are going to decide where that money goes. And 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 that's, I mean, and and what Icer said is, it's better to have that money in the hands of private individuals. Let them make the decisions. Let that. Uh, 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 that economic effect uh, uh, multiply as a result of having that money out there in individuals' hands. It's better to do that. It's more economic value to the state uh, to do that than it is to uh, to have it uh, have it in government in the in the hands of 31, uh, 31 individuals who make a decision about about where that money goes. I what we're getting to, I think, Michael is is sort of Hammond's ultimate objective or Hammond's ultimate uh, test. 
I mean, Hammond said, you know, don't cut the cut the PFD if we've got to have more govern if we've got to have more money, do it through taxes. And what it, it wasn't that Hammond wanted taxes; it's that Hammond wanted individuals, all individuals, all Alaska families, to have to face up to the fact that they were going to have to pay a, a ton of money in order to support Alaska government. Right. And 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 it would have. I mean, Hammond's vision was it would have the effect of causing people to say, no, I don't want more government. I want more money in my hands and push back on the cost of government. It was sort of – it was the income tax is a sort of Damocles, if you will, hanging over Alaskans' heads saying if you don't restrain the cost of government, then you're going to have to pay an income tax. And people saying, oh, my God, I can't do I, – I can't afford an income tax, and so let's reduce the cost of government. We're, we're almost there. We're, what we see is sort of the last gasp. Of, of the top 20% in the form of the ADN editorial board in the form of Cesar Martinson with the, with the Anchorage Press, the last gasp of, of people saying, well, we can't afford that. We can't afford to pay. I mean, the top 20% can't afford to pay income taxes. My gosh, we can't afford to pay sales taxes. We've got we to gotta find somebody else. We've got to find somebody else to pay. Let's do it in the form of PFD cuts. And, and we're almost at the completion of Hammond's, of Hammond's vision, uh, but we've got to press through and say, look, if we're going to continue to have this government, then we're going to have to pay taxes for it and then have the top 20 percent come in and say, well, we're not going to pay taxes. So we got to cut. The, we've got to cut the cost of government. Right. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, what I find interesting is that they um, that they continue to use this what I like to call fuzzy math. Uh, Cesar Martinson, in his piece, uh, talks specifically about the. Uh, uh, and he uses kind of Bill Walker esque type of math, where he says, given over the last, given that over the last five years, the earnings reserve account has been a major funding source of critical government services. Uh, if we if we re, if we use it, it will be drained, and there will only be two options. Basically, saying if we tap into it, there'll be no replenishing it. Of course, not talking about that the earnings reserve is tied not just to uh, oil production. But more importantly, to the overall you know size and earnings of the fund itself, they act like the money will not be replenished. Now, it may be replenished more or less depending on what's going on in the markets and the size of the overall fund. But it's like they ignore some of these things and they just breeze past it to justify their arguments. And I think that is starting to – I think some people are starting to pick up on that. Yeah, it, it, it's exactly – I mean, exactly right. That, that sort of comes out in the – in the um, um, so, so the, the using the earnings reserve is sort of a, is sort of a chase between the or the rate of return uh, of on the permanent fund assets coming into the earnings reserve and the rate of, and, and the rate at which we're taking it out. Right. So, if the earnings reserve is if 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 the permanent fund is earning a six percent rate of return uh, on assets and we're taking it out at five percent. Then the earnings reserve is still growing; it's replenishing itself; it's taking care of itself. If we're taking it out, if we're taking it out at five percent, and and the and the permanent fund's only producing a two percent return as it did this last this this past year, uh, then then we're taking it out at a faster rate. And and this really this this argument really gets uh, important if you talk about if we start talking about taking more than five percent out of the earnings reserve, taking more than the than the SB twenty six amount out of the earnings reserve. Um, and and taking like six or seven or eight percent, then that if you start taking you know at that level, uh, then uh, the the permanent fund isn't isn't replenishing itself uh, at 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 the same rate, and so you are beginning to drain the earnings reserve. Jeannie says non-residents who are property ta- who are property owners still pay taxes, Brad, and I think that was a discussion early on about you know you paying you know talking about tax burdens and stuff like that, Brad. Well, they pay local taxes. They don't pay state taxes, right? Um, and and there's a that's, a that's a huge difference. I mean, the deficit we, we've got issues at the local level, but the the deficits we're facing and the and the problems we're facing are at the state level. And uh, there's there's other than the other than the oil tax, which uh, the, the production tax, which taxes uh, out of state oil companies, there's no tax uh, on uh, on non-residents. That's that's one of the things about. 
that's one of the problems, uh, the economic problems created by, by using PFD cuts to fund government. You're only taxing Alaskans. You're only taking money out of the Alaska private sector. Non-residents aren't contributing at all. Uh, when you use PFD cuts uh, to raise money, and and so you're, you're you're burdening only burdening the Alaska private sector. Other states uh, get a contribution from uh, non-residents, either with, whether they use sales taxes or income taxes. They get a contribution from uh, from non-residents, um, and so the burden on 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 state citizens and other states is is smaller. What you're taking out of the local economy, uh, out of the state economy, private sector is uh, is smaller. So that that's a that's a problem with uh, uh, with using PFD cuts. Um, Christine, who often takes exception with uh, any of your discussions upon taxes at all, says, "Brad, you're only proposing a tax upon a tax upon a tax. All of it hurts us, even going after rich people. Class warfare as an excuse for hurting us." More is not acceptable, she says. Yeah, what 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 they don't what, what what people who make that comment don't understand is is the rich people aren't pushing back on government costs right now because they the top twenty percent isn't pu- pushing back on government costs because they're not feeling the burden of it. What what Hammond's vision was: if we have to raise money, let's raise it through an income tax, which would affect all income brackets. As well as as well as non-residents receiving income in the state, and and they would and then everybody would push back uh, on government costs. It's not the, the, sometimes sometimes what I say comes out or people understand it as as pushing for a tax. What 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 I want what what we're what I'm trying to do is fulfills Hammond, Hammond's vision of have of having everybody exposed to the cost of government in the same way, so that they all push back. Uh, on the cost of government, we, we don't have that now. I mean, what what happened in the last legislature is what was this unholy alliance between the top twenty percent uh, uh, rep- Republicans and the Democrats, uh, both in the House and in the Senate, uh, to continue high spending as long as the t- top twenty percent didn't have to pay for it, as long as the costs were were, were pushed off on PFD cuts down on middle and lower income Alaska families. To 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 get this. To get this thing under control, all Alaska families have to be exposed to the to the to the to the risk of having to pay significant amounts for the cost of government. Not just middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, but all Alaska families have to be exposed to the risk. And then you have this giant shoveback. I mean, what we're seeing in the ADN, and what we're seeing in Cesar is is a pushback by the top twenty percent, but the pushback is let's make somebody else pay for it. Let's use it. Let's do it through PFD cuts, which push the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. They understand the problems. They understand the exposure of high costs of government. They're just trying to push those costs somebody to somebody else. If they are exposed to it as well, they will push. They will have to push back on the cost of government. There won't be somebody else to dump those costs off on. Christine says, I know most rich people don't care, but you don't hurt the rest of us more in order to get them to pay. Wrong answer. I think that Christine's missing the whole point here, which is you're trying to give everyone skin in the game so that the overall cost of government will shrink. Because if they had to pay, if they did have to pay a portion of their income, 5%, 4%, whatever it is, all of a sudden they'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We we can't be spending all this money because now you're costing me money. If if it's not equitable, if it's not an equitable split across the board, uh, then not everybody is is going to feel that. I got twenty seconds. Well, that's that's exactly right, Michael. It's it's not we're, we're not pushing taxes for for tax for the sake of raising revenue. We're pushing taxes to expose all Alaskans to the yep. burden of the cost of government. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Uh, I want to get into number two, Brad. Give us a quick tease of number two here uh, before we uh, before we move on to the break. Well, this is sort of a follow up to previous discussions. The ADN had a had an article on uh, ballot measure one. It was it, it it was purported to be a just the facts, ma'am uh, type article. Uh, to go back to the old uh, one of the old TV shows, um, just without any bias, just uh, uh, you know what what what. The no on one, what the yes on one people are arguing, what the no on one people are arguing, but they continue to use this one billion dollar number as the amount that's going to be taken, as the amount that's going to be raised by the tax, 
and that really just distorts uh, your your understanding of, of how the tax works. So it's another it's another critique I have of the ADM this week. I, they're they're just the facts, ma'am. Article wasn't on the facts. It was distorted by the fact they're using uh, the one billion dollar number. Here's the crux of 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 the article. Um, uh, as it's trying to lay out just the facts, and it's in a, it's in one of the sub headlines in the article. It says oil companies taxes will go go up in some years by more than one billion dollars. So that triggers that statement triggers all sorts of things. It triggers the people who are concerned about the oil industry going, oh my God, we can't take a billion dollars uh, out of the oil industry and and move it to the state. That will that will do all sorts of bad things to the oil industry, including depress their incentive for additional exploration and additional activity in the state. It does it does bad things on the on the other side, <clears throat> on the yes on one side, because people say, oh well, you know, we don't have to face up to Alaska's spending problems or other issues because we're going to get a billion dollars out of the oil companies and that's gonna that's gonna help solve uh, uh, our our budget crisis. And so we don't really need to talk about all these other things like you know, taxes or PFD cuts or or cutting government spending because the oil companies are going to because that we're going to be saved that way. That number using that number triggers uh, reactions that 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 you know that, that sort of drive the 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 Proposition One debate. The problem is the number's wrong. Um, at that assumes oil prices in excess of sixty dollars. Uh, that number also assumes low production costs uh, on the on the part of uh, of the oil companies. Low production costs because that then increases the profitability uh, of the oil companies and increases the tax uh, on the companies as a result of increased profitability. The the one billion dollars is wrong. It's wrong for two reasons. One, uh, it's wrong because. Um, uh, the the oil prices are not at sixty plus sixty dollars and above. Right now, uh, A and S has gone back below forty dollars. When you look at the at the projection, the spring revenue projection put out by the Department of Revenue, we don't get out of the fifty dollar range uh, by the end of this decade by by twenty twenty nine. At the oil prices that that we're talking, and and all of this all of this discussion was set before we had all of this discussion about Prop One was set before we had the price reset uh, in the spring with COVID, which really changed the dynamics of the of the oil industry, not just for the few months that were that we're dealing with COVID, but longer term uh, as well. And and so none of these discussions that, that none of the, none of the discussion in the Bam, uh, article in the end talks about current oil prices and and projected oil prices. They're they're it's all turning to this sixty dollar plus oil price and the one billion dollars that's at stake that that the claim is at stake uh, in the tax. Really, I we published a chart on you know, on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets uh, Facebook page several times. We'll publish it again several times more. What's really going on at the oil price levels that we are at now and that we're projected to remain through the remainder of the decade is we have taxes in the range of two hundred and fifty three hundred uh, million dollars that's that's the incremental effect of of taxes at this range and that and it, and at that range the incremental effect at that range is the same as the increase in the cost of, of, of production increase in the cost that the producers are facing uh, that's going to result from transportation cost uh, increases over the next couple of years. It's about 3% of overall overall production costs. So the, realistically, the Prop 1 uh, proposal uh, doesn't have the, the Armageddon effects that the oil companies claim. It doesn't have the, the salutary effects that the Prop 1 advocates claim it's much smaller than that it's a it's a contribution toward the state's fiscal situation it's not the solution to the state's fiscal situation and at the oil pro and at, at 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 those sorts of of tax levels it's not the armageddon to the oil companies that uh, that that the oil companies uh, want want to make it out to be it's just it they the, the article by by focusing on that 1 billion uh, the article sort of inflames, uh, exacerbates the consequence 
of the of Prop One uh, beyond uh, beyond what it realistically is at the oil prices that uh, that that we're operating at now and are projected for the remainder of the decade. If you missed uh, our discussion last week on the yes and no of Prop One, how they both get it wrong, you can go back and listen to it on the podcast or watch the video on Facebook. Brad explains in detail how uh, it's what neither one says. It's essentially somewhere in the middle of what either one says, and it's one of the reasons why I think many of us are undecided on whether or not Prop 1 makes uh, sense or not. Uh, uh, You know, no or yes, uh, it's been an interesting debate for sure. Uh, Brad, let's move on to the third item, which is this Charles Wolferth article, which to me, I mean, I think he's this way a lot of times, but this article specifically just drips with disdain for anybody that happened to vote against or or fund or or support any candidate that was one of the business as usual party out there. He likes to call them the reality party. Well, it's the it's the same. There's two pieces to to this piece that I find objectionable. One, the first is it's the same theme that we talked about when we talked about the ADN. Uh, editorial board op-ed, and we talked about Cesar Martins's piece. It is, it, it is the top 20% uh, uh, attitude of, we don't want to pay this. <laughs> Let's get somebody else to pay it. We ought to be paying it through PFD cuts. Uh, we ought to be pushing it down to middle and, 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 and lower income uh, Alaska families. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, Charles is, is just sort of exuding that uh, that attitude of, of we don't want to pay, uh, we don't want government to be cut, we don't want to pay, so let's find somebody else to pay it. Let's do it through PFD cuts, which pushes the cost down to middle and, and lower income Alaska families. It, it's a it's a theme that uh, that 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 picks up on the uh, uh, picks up on the ADN uh, op-ed piece uh, earlier in the week. The, the 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 second piece of the of the of the Wolforth article, though, I find. I find interesting. Wolforth essentially spins um, the um, uh, the results of the of these primaries um, into an, ar- an argument for Prop Two, um, right. and essentially argues that the way to cut the PFD, uh, the way to get to the reality party, as he puts it, the, which in, in and in his view, the reality party is the party that cuts the PFD, pays for government through cutting the PFD. The way to the way to get to the reality party, the way to get to PFD cuts is by voting for Prop Two, uh, which is the open primaries uh, uh, proposition. Um, I, I had never thought of Prop Two <laughs> as, as being a PFD issue. Um, uh, I had always I had always focused on Prop One having PFD implica- in, implications because if the oil companies don't contribute, then then we're going to have to pay within people will push to pay for additional amounts through PFD taxes, PFD cuts. But I've never thought of, I've never thought of Prop 2 as being a PFD argument. But, but Wolferth just comes out and blasts away at it, saying, you want to cut – basically, you want to cut the PFD, vote for Prop 2, because <laughs> Prop 2 will then set up an, elect, an electoral structure uh, which will elect people who will, who will do what we want. They'll vote, to, they'll vote for PFD cuts uh, as opposed to voting to, uh, voting to protect the PFD. And I just – that that's a that's an insight to prop two I didn't I did I didn't have before that article, and it certainly raises a big concern about prop two, uh, if that's the way some people are viewing it. If that's the way that uh, that, uh, that that they think prop two is going to play out, that it will create a situation in which in which we'll have a legislature that will finally finally in their terms push for PFD cuts, um, then that's I mean that that's brought a whole new layer of of issues over to prop two that I didn't, I hadn't focused on being there before. Yeah, no, absolutely. And of course the whole basis of his argument just it blows my mind. If Alaska blows the money on the PFD uh, earnings reserve on big dividends, there won't be any basis upon which to grow a new economy. Basically saying that it's government that drives a new economy instead of, uh, you know, private industry. Uh, and then he goes on to say, even with high taxes, Alaska won't be able to afford essentials like police, prison, transportation, schools, or the university. Again, making the argument that we will cut those essential services first, that there's no way we could find any kind of uh, you know efficiencies in government. I mean, it's just more of the same. Uh, we've got 30 seconds here, Brad. Well, it's, it's, a, it's the top 20 argument, top 20% argument of don't make us pay. 
because my gosh, if you make us pay, we're going to have to cut government, <laughs> and, and and that's a bad thing. So let's let's keep pushing it off on PFD cuts and make middle and lower income Alaska families pay. It's as I say, we're almost there. We're almost to where Hammond wanted. Uh, uh, right. We just need to keep pushing this issue. I got to tell you, Brad. Again, like I said, you, I expect a certain amount of condescension for Wolf Earth on pretty much everything he talks about, but this one just drips with it. Uh, I mean, you know talking about if democracy worked, the reality party would be doing better in elections. And all I could say is, wait a second, are you saying that democracy didn't work? I mean, this is exactly how the election process worked. If people cared and were more engaged, they would have gone out and supported the business-as-usual candidates. But instead, they didn't. And, uh, I mean, I just, I, I'm just watching this like, this guy is completely disconnected from what's going on. Even though repeated removal of reality party leaders, Governor Bill Walker, Paul Seaton, and now Coghill and others, the party brought about enormous budget reductions. Really? Increased oil can industry contributions. Okay. Restructured the permanent fund to keep the state afloat. I mean, this is just, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's almost, it's ludicrous in its fictional, you know, aspects. Yeah, Michael, what, what, what he's really, instead of the reality party, think about it as the top 20% party. What, what they're really concerned about is, is the removal of, of people who have been protecting the top 20% by using PFD cuts um, and, and, and the fact that there, we're getting to a point where it's going to be clear that uh, either we cut government or all Alaskans, including the top 20%, uh, are going to have to pay. And, and, it's re- and, 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 there, and, and there's a nervousness now. I mean, what, I, what I'm taking out of these pieces is there's a nervousness that, oh, my gosh, we're, we're going to get exposed here. We're going to get exposed that that all of us are going to have to pay if we don't cut government costs. And that means we're going to have to cut government costs. And that's horrible. Um, and that's and, and, and the nervousness is that that the people who are going to protect the PFD, people who are protecting the PFD, uh, protecting middle and lower income Alaska taxpayers, um, our our families are uh, are you know are getting elected and are going to and, and are going to do that, which is going to push back, push expose the fact that the top twenty percent uh, is going to have to pay, or else we're going to have to have to go cut government. We're 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 getting very close um, to 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 getting where we need to be, and the top twenty percent is getting very nervous that we're getting close. And so they're pushing these last gasp arguments about, oh no, we can't cut the P- we can't we got to cut the PFD, we got to keep government, um, uh, because they're 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 realizing that the pro PFD the the, prote- the PFD protectors are are coming in, are going to protect the PFD, and that's going to expose them to having to make the choice of either paying up themselves or cutting government. Uh, Christine, uh, another Christine, asks, to what extent does Brad support Donna Ardwin's thinking? Did you get a chance to listen to yesterday's show? I did. Uh, I think Donna and I, I didn't go to the thing over the weekend, so I don't fully know what what it was talked about there. Um, I think Donna and I differ on mostly on the earnings reserve account. When she talks about glide path, she's talking about, you know, draws above the above the the POMV amount from the earnings reserve to create that glide path using the earnings reserve account essentially as a savings account uh, and, and, and using it to fund uh, uh, deficits uh, as, we, as, we, as we cut spending down. I have the disadvantage or the advantage of having lived through this same rhetoric uh, in 2013, 2014, 2015 when we had the CBR and we were going to use the CBR as a glide path. Uh, to uh, to fund the glide path to fund the deficits, we never did. We never cut because we had because we had uh, we had the, those savings amounts. We just kept going. We kept saying, "Oh, we'll do it next year. We'll do it next year." Remember when Lyman Hoffman said, "You know, we've made three hundred million dollars in cuts this year. We're going to make five hundred, six hundred million dollars next year." Never happened. I mean, it, the, the 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 glide path to me uh, was disproven. Uh, during the during the last decade, when when we use the CBR until until the CBR is gone, and to me, using the ERA uh, is is just a very bad policy. I mean, using the CBR was sort of like parents using their own savings account to to keep the party going, uh, even though their income had declined. 
now when we start talking about using the ERA, it's like we're now going to break into our kids' college savings account uh, to keep the party going. Uh, because the ERA is part of the permanent fund and is, and is part of the $60 billion we've got invested that's producing uh, producing uh, 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 earnings. So I, I think the big difference, uh, uh, I, I guess I guess to me, we've already had the glide path, and we failed. Right. But we've already had the glide path. Right. And now, and now we've got to take the medicine. Now we've got to now we've got to come to grips with the consequences of having drained the 16 billion, 17 billion dollars combined CBR SBR. Um, we having having drained those savings. We've got to come to grips with the consequences saying we can put it off another day by using the earnings reserve as yet another savings account for a glide path just bothers me. Uh, other than that, I think Donna and I are largely in alignment, but but that use of the earnings reserve uh, is a big issue to me. I'm going to have 60 seconds here. Ace asks, in normal states, the rich typically want less government. Why is it different here in Alaska where Democrats are leftists and a lot of Republicans are Democrats? Give me a 60-second answer, Brent. Because they don't have to pay. Because because they're in the top twenty percent, they don't have to pay for government. They've pushed it off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, right? Um, as a, as a percent of income, right? And I think Rob also makes the point because a lot of the rich in this state make their money off government contracts, and they don't have to pay for it directly. So why not? Uh, I think it's another valid point as well that there's many who benefit from government contracts in that way as well. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. We appreciate you coming on board as always. Thought-provoking, uh, good stuff. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.